Hello, this is Tannis from Inner Circle Sanctuary, our mother coven here in Las Vegas, Nevada, and it is my great fortune uh, and luck to be talking to world famous author, longtime witch and occultist, founder of several different magical orders, Wicca traditions, and one time Las Vegas resident and now resident of Canada, the incredible Tarot Star. Tarot Star, good morning. How are you doing, sir? Oh, just getting older. <laughs> I call that vintage. <laughs> so um, how are you doing in the age of this coronavirus? Has that, uh, have you been keeping safe? Well, I'm not going into the shop to do readings for customers right at the, at the moment these days. I'm just pretty much staying home. And what shop is that, sir? The Occult Shop in, uh, in Toronto. The Occult Shop in Toronto. And you have been the reader there for how many years now? Well, they brought me to Canada in 1989. Uh, and I, I worked in their retail sales department for many years until... I took my veterans pension retirement and that's been about over 20 years. And so when, I've been uh, staying there as, as a reader after retirement. That's awesome. And when you say they brought you there, who are you, who brought you there? Well, uh, Richard James, the owner of the occult uh, shop. So that, he advertised that in, he advertised in Circle Sanctuary News. I answered the ad. He sent me a plane ticket. And uh, I came to uh, Toronto and uh, been here ever since. That is so awesome. I, I, can, I just see people out there saying, wait a second, somebody put an ad and then Lou put an ad in uh, a, a world famous pagan magazine and then flew you out on their dime to work at their shop. That must really say something about how awesome you are as a reader. And well, I had already been a published author. Right. My, uh, my books had come out and, and since he, re he sells occult supplies and all that stuff, he sells those books too. So he recognized the name and, uh, that's why I got hired for here. And that's a brilliant business decision, too. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and then you, you also said that you're taking a veteran's pension. So you served in the United States Army. Was that Vietnam era? It was the Vietnam War era, yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you read the bio on the back of my book, I was in the... Um, Army Security Agency for Voice Intercept Analyst. Uh huh. And uh, recording and translating conversations on the East German Communist Party's radio telephone system. Wow. And that part of your bio, uh, as you mentioned, is on the back of your sacred pentagraph books, which we're definitely going to talk about here in a minute. When I read uh -huh. those, I wonder if, I mean, A, geez, it really sounds like for once the military got a, matched up a person's interests and talents with the career field well for once. <laughs> because you're such a, you're such a pro prolific writer and so creative a writer. And I was wondering if you, if you think that your job with languages in any way affected your eventual authoring of so many books? Well, I don't know. When I, would, I went into the Army, the Army Security Agency in 1963. And um, the Army Security Agency is classified information. Uh -huh. I was sent to study at the uh, National Security Agency at Fort Meade, Maryland, and uh, became um, uh, developed the skills for voice intercept analysis. 
Wow. And in both um, uh, German and uh, being able to identify Russian military traffic also at that time. Wow. And that was that was a big deal back then with Berlin and the airlift and the wall and uh, the cold. Oh, yeah, the wall went up in, in 61, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's just an amazing background. Now to get to the books you've written and especially, like I am just blown away by your two volume set on the sacred pentagraph tradition. Uh, many of us have been buying your books on spellcraft and things like that for many years, oil recipes, your magical formulary, and then the sacred pentagraph comes out and it is just, uh, it's, there's so much information, I don't know where to start, kind of. Um, it's, it's a complete turnkey system of Wicca that anybody could start their own coven or their own practices. I think it's really yeah. amazing. It, it's how to uh, set up um, a craft coven sort of along the lines of a, an occult lodge with degrees in the craft and rising on the degrees. Mm -hmm. So basically, there was there was so many uh, big shirts, big uh, big frogs in little ponds back then. Yeah, and they were all egos and and uh, uh, various spats going on back and forth. Right. And so, uh, those of us at the um, the Bell Book and Candle Shop in in Las Vegas. Uh, we tried to get rid of those uh, witch wars and that kind of stuff that was going on in those days. Right. There were just too many inflated egos uh, around the craft then. Yes. The um, the Bell Book and Candle Shop with uh, Charmaine Day. Mm -hmm. She she wrote the Magic Candle book. Right. Another great book. I was uh, I worked with her the last ten years of her life. Yeah. So. That's awesome. We, I'd like to ask you about some of the personalities in Las Vegas uh, back then, uh, but real quick. Uh, so the Bell Book and Candle closed uh, finally in 2014 out here in Las Vegas. It was that. Well, the thing. Yeah. Well, she she opened that. <clears throat> they came from Houston, Texas, Charmaine and her husband. They were friends with Sybil Leak. <clears throat> and um, so they opened the Bell Book and Candle Shop. And it was originally at, at uh, the 1400 block Las Vegas Boulevard South. Yes. And then it moved to the 1500 block of East Charleston, mm -hmm. right next to the bank on the corner at 15th Street. Right. There was a building there with a, with a shop in the bottom, on the bottom floor. There was residences upstairs and a shop at the bottom. Uh, but that building's long since been taken down. Mm. Uh, then they moved down to the 1700 block of East Charleston. Yeah. To to the shop uh, front there. But um, 82 was a bad year. We lost uh, Chriswell of Chriswell Predicts and Ed Wood movie fame. Uh -huh. We lost um, Sybil. We lost Charmaine. Right. All in that same year. That was a bad year. So the, the uh, Charmaine's husband ran the, the Bell Book and Candle Shop there for a few years, mm -hmm. and then he sold it to a, a man called uh, Lucky Simone. Right. And he ran it for years. Uh, they also had a shop fire there. 
Oh. Uh, but it was re- got it restored. Um, but he couldn't keep up the payments. <clears throat> right. For the rent. So it was taken over by a relative of uh, Jerome Criswell. And uh, she ran it for a number of years until she passed. Yeah. And that was my high priestess, Robin Criswell. Yeah. My, my, uh, the way I found the craft and magic was that bell book and candle after Lucky had bought it, but Steve Day was still working there. So it was actually. Yeah, Steve. Yeah, uh, Lucky kept Steve on because Steve ran the business. And Lucky got to play Mr. Big Shot. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, and I, the, the odd thing is, I went down there, I don't know how many times, buying books and buying supplies and stuff like that just on my own, uh, always with Steve. And when Lucky was actually in the shop, it was as if he, tr- he kept his back to me. It was as if there was just something like, I don't know. Uh, it was, it was an odd thing. He even came like uh, Steve asked him a question one time while I was there for me. And it was as if lucky sidled, sidled up to Steve, but kept his back to me uh, and didn't want anything to do with me. It was odd. Uh-huh. But anyway, yeah. So you were a mover and shaker uh, of the Las Vegas occult and craft scene back then. You had your own shop. You started... Well, over on... Um, um, I guess it was uh, Bruce Street. Mm-hmm. Bruce and Fremont area. Okay. <laughs> they, um, there was a little building, a little shop I had, what was called the Ye Old Herb Doctor. Mm-hmm. And I would uh, get my supplies from the suppliers in in Los Angeles for candles and just regular. I had a little occult shop there going for a while. Yeah. And with, called uh, the Ye Old Herb Doctor. Right. And I think, well, I I got here in '89, which is the year you left for Canada. So I wasn't able to get to your shop. Uh, when did you close that up? Well, the old herb doctor, well, let's see. Uh, <coughs> well, the um, it's okay. business fell up. There was that big culinary strike. Right. And all the business, all the small businesses suffered because most of your clientele were culinary workers. Yeah. In that vast union. Right. And so the the, the cash flow in Las Vegas suffered all over, right across. Sure. For every, for everyday people. I I think. And so a lot of little businesses just couldn't survive. Yeah. And so I, think- I went. Um, um, out on um, moved out on Boulder Highway with uh, and took a job with uh, Robert Lawson's The Psychic Eye. Right. So I was to, uh, there as their uh, retail sales. Uh huh. <laughs> So I worked for him for a while, and um, then um, that's where I saw the ad in Circle Sanctuary News. That's so interesting. <laughs> I answered the ad and yeah, got sent my plane ticket to Toronto. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I, I think. I think when I first got here, that culinary strike was still going on. I think it's spanned for several years, and of course, uh, still have problems with some of the uh, 
major casino companies out here not not taking care of their people. Uh, but um, I missed you at Psychic Eye too. I mean, I found out about uh, spring of '89 is when I first uh, found my way to Bell Book and Candle. So I missed you at Psychic Eye. But of course, they're still going in in town too, different locations. But we have several sub, uh, several psychic guys around town. And well, yeah, they were first in the commercial center there. Right, right. And I and uh, then they opened uh, uh, so several branches. <coughs> mm-hmm. And I drive past the locations of Bell Book and Candle every once in a while too. The last location is still there in a uh, in a strip mall along Charleston, and it's a craft like you know arts and crafts type store now. But I believe it's the first location is still up but abandoned and for sale, which is a sliver type building along Las Vegas Boulevard and I think Fourth Street. It's in the 14, there they were originally in the 1400 block of Las Vegas Boulevard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it might have, it might be a different building, you know, uh, how Vegas is knocking things down and rebuilding them, but the uh, there is still a building there that every once in a while ago, I think, I drive past and I think the original Bell Book and Candle was there. So, uh, you started uh, the... All Saints Church of Mystic Science. Can you tell us about that? Oh, okay. All Saints Church of Mystic Science. Okay. Well, um, there was kind of a dispute over that. Oh? Between... um, uh, Lady Laura Latagius and myself. She was one of the one of the founders of the of the church. Uh huh. And Stephen Charmaine. They sort of envisioned a um, uh, ordination mill, like. Um, that uh, church in in uh, California, right? The Universal Life that Lordania for as anything for their fee, right? And you're covered by their tax exempt as long as you keep registered with them. Okay. So Stephen Charmaine figured they could we could do that with uh, a church <clears throat> in. Uh, in Nevada, since okay. it's easier to get get corporate status in Nevada. Right. So um, they made the church. <clears throat> they were thinking of making it an ordination mill. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, Lady Laura and myself uh, just didn't like that kind of um, an idea or association. Sure. So we carried on, created the, uh, the church with, uh, <clears throat> congregation meeting at, uh, the old, uh, building at, um, Kent and Carson, uh-huh. the old church building there. Oh, wow. That's since gone. It's gone too, I think now. Yeah. So we had, uh, had the, the church in there. We were renting that uh, the church uh, church space there. So we had a, a pretty good uh, uh, sizable group for for that. Uh huh. And this was uh, about what 1976, 1977. Yeah, the late 70s. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Did you have? The sacred, the sacred pentagraph tradition more in mind than a uh, ordination mill. Is that what you were you and Lady Laura had more in mind? Yes. <clears throat> we were. Um, <clears throat> we were fleshing out 
the uh, sacred pedograph system. Mm -hmm. Also, when Stephen Charmaine was still involved with it, Sybil Leak would come around uh, the Bell Book and Candle to visit with Sybil. Uh huh. And so the we would she was a kibitzer. She wasn't a a, a party to it, <clears throat> but she would offer insight into craft stuff. Okay. So the sacred pentagraph has sort of input by Sybil, but <clears throat> nobody's going to uh, be trying to say there's initiations by Sybil League. That's um, a lot of people were doing that in those days. But um, it was a joke. Uh, Sybil and Charmaine would laugh about these uh, initiations they were uh, <coughs> excuse me they were asked to perform uh -huh. uh, people would come up and oh Sybil you just got to initiate me or I'll just die <laughs> the, the psychic gushes you know uh-huh. So what she would do is spin them around thrice Petersons and say, you're a witch, you're a witch, you're a witch. <laughs> and they'd go off on with uh, high hopes, getting an initiation by Sybil Leak. Uh-huh. <laughs> so they used, to, they used to just laugh over those things. Well, and and realistically, let, some some people that is all they would want, right? You're you were what's providing, that? You're providing a service in in that respect. I, I didn't catch that. What was it? I said uh, you were uh, or they were providing a service in some respect because a lot of people that that probably is all they want. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it was a joke to them. So. Yeah. You do make mention yeah. several times through the sacred pentagraph books that if you're not willing to put in the work, uh, you know, look somewhere else. Do, do something. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. There's someplace else in the craft for you. Mm -hmm. But if uh, you're going to work at a system, start it at the beginning and work it all the way through. Yeah. And there's so much good material to work through in the sacred pentagraph tradition so many uh so many ritual ideas so many um just ad advice and pointers i mean it's just it's an incredible system that uh you have on your website witchworld109.com that people can uh purchase there and get it directly to their email uh or it has been printed by Left Hand Press in two beautiful volumes that are available on Amazon and I believe Barnes and Noble too. And they did a really yeah. good job with it. I, I did both. I like the big format of printing out your um, sacred pentagraph work uh, and I've got it in a binder. And then I got the books and they did a, just a really beautiful job with it. Uh -huh. so, so highly, highly suggested for people out there uh, who are looking for a tradition that will keep them busy, keep them thinking, and uh, keep them working magic and uh, and doing doing the work uh, with the gods and goddesses. It's it's just yeah. incredible. Uh, are, are you the Are you the one that runs the, the sacred pentagraph uh, site on uh, Facebook? No, sir. The sacred pen. I was going to ask you about that. Thor Nightwind is the uh, priest who runs the sacred pentagraph uh, Facebook page, as well as other ones. Uh, That's Matt, Matt Dogenbaugh. Correct. Correct. Yeah, and he's 
uh, definitely putting out the good word about the sacred pentagraph tradition and posting lots of pictures of things they do. And uh, yeah. it's awesome. Along those lines, another group that you mentioned quite a bit is Star Meadow. Can you tell us about that? Star Meadow. Was I see? Oh, well, that was the name of the. <clears throat> that was the name of the uh, the coven that was operating out of uh, the Bell Book and Candle Shop. Okay. Nice. So, as the father of these traditions and seeing that they are still being worked in the world and uh, and growing. I, I would hope and assume that that gives you a good sense of pride in your work. Oh, well, I try not to be a stuffed shirt, so. <laughs> but we certainly appreciate it. Uh, and one of the things that I think is so great about uh, the thing, so many of the things you've written is you can really start with the basics and really progress in a systematic, logical, step-by-step -step method. So for example, you wrote a book for solo witches and it, uh, you know, eight Sabbaths for solo witches. And so if you're all alone and want to get to know the Sabbaths and the deities and, you know, what's going on through the, that wheel of the years, that's a great book to start. Now it's, not impressed right now, but I'm really hoping it is because it's such good material. And then with your Book of Shadows, there is in the back uh, Rituals for a Coven of Three. Uh -huh. and, then, and then, of course, the Sacred Pentagraph tradition uh, and the books for the Sacred Pentagraph, which fully fleshes out uh, really any group, what any group uh, would need to know to grow, to thrive. And so did you see this whole tradition kind of in your mind's eye uh, and then write it down? Or was it learning by practicing or a mixture of both? How did it all come to be? Well, I don't know. I don't know. Uh... I had a night job at the time and a lot of time with nothing happening. So I would just, just write. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the ideas just seemed to flow. I don't like to use the idea channeling, mm -hmm. but it's just sort of an inspiration that just seemed to come across the path uh, through my writing. Um, and a lot of the ideas just developed into those two handwritten uh, copies, uh -huh. the uh, works of the high priest and the works of the high priestess. Mm -hmm. And those so, are in the sacred pentagraph uh, book, volume one and are just fantastic. And it's interest. It's just super interesting and it makes total sense how you have the works of the high priest are the solar festivals of the year being the equinoxes and solstices and the works of the high priestess being the terrestrial sabbats of uh, Candlemas, Midsummer, Lamas, and uh, Samhain or Hallowmas. Well, yeah, the, <clears throat> mm -hmm. the quarter and cross quarter days. Yeah. The, um, the sun sets the order for the quarter days, and uh, six weeks later, the earth responds with the cross quarter mm -hmm. as the seasonal changes. Yeah, it's beautiful how you have it set up. And you also have in the sacred pentagraph uh, ritual suggestions and ideas, but fully fleshed out scripts if people want to use them for all the different new moons and full moons throughout the year. 
Yeah. So a lot of the spell books that you wrote, uh, my beautiful friend, Lady Iris, Kate up in Canada, who introduced, uh, well, yeah, introduced me to you, um, said that many of the spells in your spellcraft books were from customers coming into Bell Book and Candle and asking you how to magically solve some of the problems that they had. So yes, I, and also problems uh, revealed during uh, Terra Reads, yeah. So I think it's one of the things that we definitely have run into out here, especially coming from what you know we, we could say is a, is a candle shop tradition, um, so many people aspire to someday owning a candle shop, maybe being the reader there. Uh, and um, I was quickly disabused of that notion by, you know, working uh, with my high priestess uh, a few times in the Bell Book and Candle in its later days. But maybe you could give us some insight on, on what that is like. That was a little, uh, uh, uh complicated what, what it's okay i'm having a little difficulty hearing i apologize can you tell us what it's like to work in a candle shop and with the problems people have and the advice they come to you seeking oh well um like um the tarot readers like the poor man psychiatrist Mm -hmm. And um, you get the uh, people get a reading, and any problems in their life seems to show up during the tarot. The tarot is very insightful. Uh huh. And then you can also do spreads to find out how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And that'll suggest remedies that you can recommend through the uh, uh, merchandise that the uh, that an occult shop sells. Right. From what and we... my my spell books were really written for the for the trade uh, to recommend products available through the uh, occult supplies trade. Right. And I know a lot of the oil recipes that we used in Bell Book and Candle in the later days are from your uh, uh, Witch's Formulary and Spell Book and uh, some of your other, other books as well. And they are just fantastic oil recipes. They smell incredible and the associations with the ingredients are just uh, spot on as well. Yeah, they are. Um, the, <clears throat> the oil formulary was used by the uh, by Charmaine at the Bell Book and Candle, mm -hmm. but she had um, a previous association with I think something called Blue Star. Oh, okay. And they had uh, a rudimentary. Uh, oil formulary, and then Bell Book and Candle um, expanded on that that formulary over the years. Mm -hmm. So it's um, formulas for things that have been passed around and um, sort of improved upon or expanded. So it's got quite uh, quite a track record. Absolutely. And the techniques in the, and so many of your spell books, uh, they're not only effective, but they're very fun to do. And I attribute that a lot to your the way you write uh, so often in rhyme and the use of, uh, you know, the old fanciful type of English that puts you in a magical frame of mind. 
Yeah, basically, because that's where magic uh, originates is uh, in the mind. Right. You got to stoke it up and uh, let it run. Right. So what we saw uh, in in Bell Book and Candle was love and money spells were the top sellers, but then clearly there were people that wanted to do break up spells and hexes and bad magic. Uh, would you say that was about accurate uh, in your time in Las Vegas? Oh yeah, love, luck, money are the basics. Uh, <coughs> and how to get back at enemies. Mm -hmm. And then how to get rid of the ooga boogas. Uh huh, for sure. Is that about the same in Canada? Or, or is it a different crowd of people? Uh, no, basically, Canadians are pretty much um, Americanized, you might say, culturally. The, the culture of North America is. Uh, pretty much similar. Okay. But there's just sort of a difference in in um, uh, attitudes for certain things, I guess. Mm -hmm. And much better weather in Canada. <laughs> well, uh, basically my pension stretches farther in Canada. That's why I stay. Ah, very good converted into Canadian, it, it gives me a sizable amount of money each month. Mm -hmm. So I've, so, uh, uh, I've contacted you a few times and you've been very nice to answer me and uh, talk about some, uh, a, you know, a little bit about Las Vegas history in the occult world. And, um, my priestess in 1991 paid off the uh, back fees for the All Saints Church of Mystic Science and uh, probably some extra to uh, Steve Day to start it back up again, which they did in the 90s. And it was the basis of our church status for Temple of the Inner Circle. And so it's even though it's just legal documentation that we have some link to you and the work you did in the 70s, we're very, we're very uh, happy about that, that we have some link to you at all and the work that you did. What's that? Well, we, you we have had, in the 90s, we had legal documentation that you started basically in the, in the 70s with All Saints Church uh -huh. and Science. And we were at, uh, had church status for a while too. So it was, a, even though we are not the same uh, coven, it was as if we had uh, some kind of link to you and the work that you did in the 70s. Okay. And did you, you had talked about the uh, Berte Specialties Shop, which when I was out here was on West Charleston around Rancho and how they would have their uh, coven ladies dress in Egyptian and be out on the sidewalk trying to get business into the store. And not too long after that, uh, we found pictures of the ladies dressed in Egyptian, but I think at the Rosicrucian Center that used to be uh, right off of Charleston. So it was... Well, Murder used to be on Fremont Street. Oh, is that right? And in the heat of summer, those poor gals had to wear his sandwich boards and dress up like Egyptians. Right. And I wander up and down hot Fremont Street, advertising his shop. I think by the time that I was stationed here, the shop had moved to Charleston, just west of Rancho, and when I stopped in there, because it was still listed in the yellow pages as a metaphysical shop, 
or a cult shop. It was it was mostly like magnetic bracelets and massage chairs. Well, yeah, he he went to for the the new age stuff in a big way. Uh huh. That was super interesting. <laughs> was the uh, how would you describe the occult scene in Las Vegas in the seventies? Oh, that's in the seventies. Well, or into the eighties. That's where the there were the big frogs and little ponds and the, and the stupid witch wars that were going on. Uh, even because in of Vegas? people's inflated egos. Yeah. Mm. How how have you seen things change, or have they, over the years? Well, I don't know. I don't get much contact with the craft anymore these days. I just uh, go into the occult shop and do my uh, tarot reads for my clients. And I don't really hear anything going on in the craft. Mm. So I really don't know what's what the status is today. Well, hopefully that will change somewhat if we... Uh... If people know that you are there at the occult shop and know more about your books, I think they would be much better off. Yeah, well, um, that's why I got them published. To get the information out circulating in the craft and let it work its magic. And it does, absolutely. We There are several books that you have talked about getting republished that are you know out of print right now uh and things like the book for the solo witches is it possible to get those re uh reprinted and new editions sometime soon because they're such good material well i was trying to get a hold of um The Book of Shadows publisher is no longer in business. Uh huh. But the other stuff is available through original publishing in New York. Oh, okay. But I think they got bought up by international imports. Oh, okay. So they should have the copyrights or the whatever, whether they want to uh, <clears throat> republish them or not. You have to badger international imports. Gotcha. And I'm sure you heard about the Anna Riva company uh, closing up shop, but a company called Espiritu using a lot a of... A company those... called the what? Uh, Spiritu taking over for Anna Riva products. Well, that's international imports, isn't it? Anna Riva products. And I'm sh we used quite a bit of those when we formulated the oils with your recipes. Uh -huh. Those are you know, some of the things, uh, candle, more candle shop news that I'm sure you, you've been aware of for a long time, dealing with the, the publishers and producers and of the occult world. Well... Um. Uh, those minor books were were published by uh, uh, that uh, international imports. I don't know how they could be. Um, you have to contact them and see if they're interested in in redoing them. Right. Well, but if. Uh, if after so many years the copyright runs out, then it becomes free game, I guess. Well, and the most direct place of getting the sacred pentagraph tradition is right on your witch, uh, right on your website, witchworld109.com, which is where I got uh -huh. them. Um, maybe is there any possibility of adding some of your books to witchworld109.com? That's what I'm planning on doing. Um, <clears throat> but right now I'm hunkering down because of this virus. Absolutely. 
but I'm planning on uh, as soon as it's able to things sort of get back to normal is get a my computer friend to uh, help me scan in and uh, post a lot of things onto uh, Witch World 109. And Lady Iris, that's a, that's my future pro uh, project. Well, uh, that's awesome. We'll look forward to that. Because that, that's perfect. Uh, Lady Iris told me that you use 109 because that was the address of, was it the Wiccan Church of Canada? Or you, you mentioned it in one of your books that it was Pagan Paradise. Oh, yeah. That's, uh, that's the, um, the craft group <laughs> that Richard and Tamara James run. They're, they're the owners of the uh, cult shop in Toronto. Uh-huh. And the Wiccan Church of Canada is their pagan group. It's um over the years uh, uh, uh the it's 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 uh, the population of the of the group has raised and lowered and um mm -hmm. so and you have actually I, ritual scripts from some of the rituals that you've worked with them from uh, the early 2000s in the Sacred Pentagraph book as well. Yeah, uh, I was taken on as uh, associate clergy for the Wiccan Church of Canada. Mm -hmm. So occasionally I would do Sacred Pentagraph rituals for for the... Uh, uh, me meeting services for the Wiccan Church of Canada, yeah. Just a personal question, which tarot deck do you use for reading for clients? What decks do I do for reading tarot? Yes. Okay. Um, I keep separate decks, one reading for men and one reading for women. Oh. Hanson Roberts to read for women, and a new Palladini deck for reading for men. Interesting. And they seem to pick up the vibes better. Yeah, I was just going to ask, and you you get better results, maybe more more specific. Well, no, the cards just seem to. Uh, pick up the uh, the vibes of, of the Quarant. Uh, the, the Hanson Roberts just seems to fit the feminine mindset and the uh, new Palladini picks up the masculine uh, okay. energies. Oh, that's so cool. That's really cool. And in, your, in the Sacred Pentagraph book, in the Cornucopia section of the book, I believe you talk about using playing cards for divination, and you have. Uh, well, yeah, they're the uh, original way to uh, learn to read cards. Yeah, the the playing cards. And they were um, used before before tarot became widespread. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a system of reading the playing cards in that, yeah. And you have other forms of divination in there, including uh, a set of runes that is really cool too. Do you, uh, what can you tell us about those? Okay, well those were just part of symbols that um, came through when I was writing the uh, the sacred pentagraph stuff. They, they just seemed to reveal themselves. So that's the collection of those runes there. And magically speaking, your methods of invoking and dismissing make a lot of sense and you explain them perfectly and clearly but they are very different from people who practice uh, Gardnerian style Wicca, uh, which seems to be 
based on Golden Dawn type of techniques, uh, where Golden Dawn would go Jeshul to invoke, uh, you go Wittershins. Maybe you can explain that to us. Uh, the Okay, the key uh, is in the pentagram. Mm -hmm. Draw an invoking pentagram and you end up creating a Wittershins motion on the ether. Mm -hmm. Draw a vanishing pentagram and you end up creating a diesel motion on the ether. Mm -hmm. The vanishing cleanses the space, but there's nothing in it. It gives you a clean space where the Wittershins motion calls in what you're invoking. Mm -hmm. So into a specific space. So you just have to go by the uh, flow created by the pentagrams that you draw in the ether. And it's very effective as anybody who has uh, done the rituals as you write them uh, knows. That's so very effective. Um, well, the hour is beginning to wane. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for taking this time to talk to me, Tarot Star. I greatly appreciate it. Is there anything you'd like to say before we say goodbye? Well, basically, practice your craft as you're inspired to. And it'll grow from there. Blessed be all. Blessed be those that bless us. Thank you very much, Tarot Star. Okay.